doing all of that, I'm going to introduce you to one of my connections, <laughs> Mr. Di Davis. <laughs> Thank you very much indeed, Dalim, and uh, good, after, good evening, everybody. Who has just been made trustee of something very trustworthy, which is called the U I U UK Cybersecurity Council. Hey. So, which you will be hearing more, no doubt, in the future. <laughs> Jolly good. Well, I'm not talking about, um, um, and I should perhaps add, having been introduced that way, thank you, Dalim. Yeah. That uh, all my views are my own, not those of any organization that I may belong to, or may want to kick me out after what I say tonight. Um, <laughs> I'm happy to answer questions from the audience here. Um, so if anybody has any questions while I'm going along, please don't hesitate to interrupt me. The worst answer you'll get is that I'll fit the answer in later if I think the answer is going to fit in a bit later in the talk. So, what am I going to talk about? Well, um, the first thing I'm going to talk about is uh, what do I mean about the Internet of Things? Um, what, what kind of things does it cover? Uh, I'm then going to talk about um, what I call static security um, and non-static security and where the issues arise. And talk a little bit about motor cars or rather motor car charging points, which is uh, an interesting bit of law. Uh, in the United Kingdom, talk a bit about product liability, some privacy issues. Actually, I'm not going to, you please today, I'm not going to talk about GDPR. Um, I say that because, um, you know, if, if, you, if, you, if you want a GDPR, that's fine, but don't have the Internet of Things. I mean, the two things are a complete uh, contradiction to one another. <laughs> you, can't have, you can't have, you can have one or the other, but you can't have both. Um, and then I'll talk a little bit about some new laws in, in other countries rather than just the UK. So um, without further ado, let's talk about um, what do I actually mean about the Internet of Things. And if you, are, uh, if you want a definition of jewellery, don't go on Wikipedia. Because Wikipedia is not very good with definitions of things like jewellery or women's clothes and stuff like that, because most people who contribute to Wikipedia, uh, believe it or not, are... IT orientated, but um, do go on Wikipedia if you're interested in definitions of IT related stuff. So go on to Wikipedia and you have a look at definition of things like the Internet of Things. And it is a fairly good place for a definition because, of course, if people disagree with the definition, they can have the opportunity to change it. And then eventually it kind of co coalesces into what most people would regard as uh, a good definition in that case of the Internet of Things. So uh, what, it, what, do we, what requirements what do we need for something which is uh, an Internet of Things device? Um, well, it has to be a physical object rather than a virtual object, something which is tangible, um, which has some sort of connection technology, some sort of sensor software, something in it which allows it to connect to something else. Uh, to connect to another device over a network. It doesn't have to be the internet, although, of course, most of the Internet of Things devices that are uh, proffered to us by uh, shops, etc., are indeed connected over the internet. It doesn't have to be the internet. It be could be a private network. So you think about it, um, it doesn't have to be a, a necessarily an act, what I call an active device. It doesn't have to be a device which emits uh, and itself is, is capable of communicating to uh, the internet. Of course, it could be, it could be a smart fridge or something, which itself has a Wi-Fi or a Zigbee uh, unit in it, which emit, which is a transmitter, allows it to transmit to, in that case, usually the internet. I mean, it could be something like a, 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 a credit card, which is a passive device, which if you place it near a, a connected device will, uh, Details. And one of the interesting things, of course, about, about, um, think about the definition of what it is, is that by definition, you are allowing something to be tracked. You're allowing that Internet of Things device to be tracked by the network, or whatever the network is, or the Internet, if it's the Internet. I mean, every time I use my, uh, my credit card, the credit card company and lots of others who actually sub-process for the separate credit card company know where I am by definition. 
So uh, by definition, you are collecting data about people or rather about their devices when you use these uh, things. Um, because each Internet of Things device is individually addressable. My credit card is not the same as yours, and every single Internet of Things device, by definition, again, or in the requirement of it, is it's a, it's a uniquely addressable object. So, let me talk about um, traditional, what you might call traditional applications, by which I mean they've been around for a long time. And one of the very first trials of uh, what you might call Internet Things device uh, was actually um, British Airways, as long ago as 1999, trying to get luggage not lost. Well, quite a long time ago, about 23 years, they're still getting luggage. <laughs> um, <laughs> Oh, no. well, they did try, even in, in, in Manchester Airport, Manchester, 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 to work at that time. Would, would, would a barcode be considered a sensor? Would a barcode, well, a barcode, yes, by definition. Is it, is it called by my definition? Yes, it's an object. Yes, it's passive. Can it, can it be interrogated by a communications network? Yes, so you could regard a barcode as a very primitive Internet of Things device under the definition which most people seem to adopt. But having said that, what, what, what I'm going to talk about for most of today is what I might call not passive devices like a barcode or like a credit card, but an active device, one which is actually uh, commit, co communicating directly with the network. And the, uh, the, last, the last bullet on the slide, uh, Amazon Warehouse, you know, you, you have a passive, you have an active, you can either have a passive or an active device, which is actually transmitting where those that stock is to the rest of the network you have a passive device uh, actually on i mean you could regard you could regard a barcode on a product not necessarily as an internet of things device because it's not unique it's just telling you that that is a particular book or whatever it may be that's been taken off the shelf but all the books have the same barcode on it on them so in that sense it's not it's not doesn't, isn't caught by my Internet of Things definition because it's not uniquely addressable. It, address it just defines that particular book. It doesn't define the particular book that you picked up. So, a bar, but a barcode, you know, on a piece of luggage is likely to be not an Internet of Things device because it's it's just got the destination on it. Doesn't although it may do, or it may be unique to you because it may also have your personal details on it and be uh, so that the airline can attribute that particular piece of luggage to you rather than somebody else. Depends on how it's actually configured. Of course, more traditionally, people think about things like smart meters, or as I call them, spy meters yeah. uh, in, in homes, uh, which will uh, tell you how much water or electricity or gas you've used. Um, autonomous vehicles, which are other obvious examples um, of Internet of Things applications, or smart fridges, dishwashers, etc. Interestingly, my dishwasher collapsed about two weeks ago and has got bought a new dishwasher. I declined to pay the extra hundred pounds for the connected dishwasher. The concept of being in London and switching my dishwasher on doesn't really fill me with any joy. So why do we? These are traditional. These are traditional. Why I call them traditional is because they're big. They're all what I call big ticket items. You know, they are things which you conceptually think, okay, well, I could put a, I could put a, a Internet of Things device into that. I said, why I want to pay an extra hundred pounds just to connect my dishwasher? I don't know. So there's an issue about cost there, but um, they are what have been around for a long time. But there's lots of other examples of Internet of Things devices. 
And you think about stuff such as Google Glasses, which we don't have anymore. Um, however, there are lots of other um, equivalents of Google Glasses on the, on the list. Uh, some of the some some of them, and they they're they're exactly the same type of thing, which which will connect to the um, telephone and goes to the internet um, or health points that health devices, um, which we'll look at um, in a minute. These are, if you like, smaller, smaller devices. I'm going to look at uh, things like the, um, the Jawbone app that will be on your wrist to see how fit you are. Um, we'll look at those. Do you know how long the Google Glass has been around? Sorry? Do you know how long it's been around? Three months. <laughs> you know, the, the Thema, a uh, guy called Thema, uh, ex uh, MIT guy, he's been wearing it continuously for the over 30 years. Okay. I kept telling me it's coming in the next two years. <laughs> well, you know, it came, it came, and it came and it went. British Airways tried it as well. I think it was British Airways who tried it. People can check it. For lots of reasons. Um, not just with the users, but also with the people who were being watched through Google Glass. But you can still buy these, uh, these equivalents. But I mean, these devices, of course, again, by definition, um, smaller, but Moore's law. Say that you've had your turn, but um, somebody tell me what Moore's law is. I know there's a lot of people said put their hand up and said they're in IT. Capacity over eighteen What's months. Yeah, doubling your capacity over eighteen month period. Yeah, yeah. every eighteen months you have a, a device, a processing device will double in processing power. The, the processing power available will double uh, in a chip. Uh, every 18 months and every 18 months also the cost the cost will halve. Yeah. so there's a fourfold increase every 18 months and that was held true for about 25 30 years um, Moore's law about uh, the processing power so you apply that to something like what we're talking about which is internet things um, and you think okay it depends upon what assumptions you make but in the next four or five years um it won't cost you a hundred pounds to put the Internet of Things device into a fridge, and in fact, I suspect it's a, that's the real cost of that is about five and not not hundred quid. Um, but you you apply that to uh, to something like Internet of Things, and you, you realise that in four or five years' time, putting a microprocessor chip, an active microprocessor chip, uh, there's a power issue, of course, as to how do you how do you maintain the power even for low. Uh, power output such as Zigbee, which is supplying Wi Fi, but much, much lower power. And, um, a low power device like that. But you, you, you put it into a piece of clothing, how much is it going to cost you? A penny? A penny? At some point in time, the cost of putting a, a connected device into a shirt, like the one I'm wearing, or one tie, or whatever it may be. It will become so low that you'd be an idiot not to put it in. In other words, you put it in first and then figure out a way to use it later. I mean, just think how many chairs. Well, actually, chairs is a bad example. Um, but in, in uh, you know, you think about cutlery from a upmarket, um, an upmarket hotel like the Savoy. So you know, this I don't know if the Savoy has its own um, crest on its. Totally, but lots of market hotels do have a unique, you know, you could put a, you could put a um, Internet of Things addressable device in there and you'd save a lot of money with the cutlery not walking out the door. Um, and, uh, hotel towels and all sorts of things, which would be, be quite logical to put it in to, uh, to, save, to, to save money. So, so what I'm saying is you, you, it's, not, it's not these big devices that are so much the problem, but you think about where, where, is, this, where is this all going to go? None of these chairs that you're sitting on have Internet of Things devices on, Internet of Things connected device now, but in two years, three years' time, why would a manufacturer not put it in if the cost was a penny? You know, the manufacturing cost is trivial. And then, uh, then the VCS know that they haven't lost any chairs. Uh, although I don't think you walk out the BCS with chairs on the back. <laughs> um, so it's not so much what it is, it's not so much what is used at the moment, but what, the way it's going. 
And of course, there are there are there are, there are examples of clothing which are connected. This is a, a polar um, sweatshirt, which does much the same thing uh, as a jawbone up. In other words, it tracks your uh, health as you exercise in the in that uh, sweatshirt. So there's already examples um, of what I'm talking about um, in in the concept of clothing, anyway. And what about humans? Subcutation, subcutaneous. Um, well, you know, there are Californian companies that will put it, and, and I think Swedish as well, that will put a chip in you um, so that you can swipe and open your door uh, and everything else that you want to do at home. You know, that's another example of what is essentially an Internet of Things device, but that's all the ultimate because it's your, if you're a accessible device in you. No, thank you personally, but obviously people want these things or else these companies wouldn't be in existence. Um, I was introduced as a lawyer. I am going to talk about lots of things, but not technology, you'll be pleased to know. Well, not that much technology, not a lot of details of technology, but I'm talking a little bit about that law. And um, being a lawyer, I do actually have a look at these terms and conditions. So let's have a look at the toolbar. This is one of the most popular um, bracelets for um, monitoring your fitness. And of course, lots of companies promote these because they want healthy workforces. And, uh, you know, I walk around various conferences and people and things like this. And, and I say to, I sort of, I, sort, I remember having a chat with somebody at one of these security conferences and said, oh, that's an interesting device you've got. I knew exactly what it was because it was one of these dual benefit devices. I have to say, sorry, Mike. And, and I said, um, oh, so uh, do you like wearing this device? being in a fairly neutral. And he says, oh yeah, it's great. I said, why is he that? He says, well, I get cheap insurance. I get a free coffee every other day. Um, no, because, because the company who sponsors this wants him to, to exercise. And if he, exercise, if, they, if he can see, if he wears it and, in, and, they, and they see he's done 5,000 steps in a day or whatever it is, he gets a free cup of coffee um, at Starbucks or whatever it is. So it was quite, it's quite a popular device if only because it is promoting the health for the individual, but also giving them perks at the same time. What the, what the actual uh, details say? Oh yeah, so the advertiser that you're a user, you can, you, to everyone you can find using your profile image. So it's kind of an open source uh, data. Um, we can share information with joint ventures under their control, whatever the joint venture under their control is. What that means is if they do a deal with uh, your employer, that they can share the information as to where you are and how you're exercising with, that with the employer. They also say the terms and conditions can be varied at will, whatever they want them to do. It's not, both, not much better uh, if you look at Fitbit, um, as Fitbit has a non-exclusive transferable, sub-licensable, basically do whatever they want with the, with the information. Not quite as bad as Facebook's original terms and conditions. Uh, Facebook's original terms and conditions basically were very simple. They said, we own the data. Sorry. Fitbit is now owned by Google, so that may not apply anymore. <laughs> oh, yeah. In other words, we can do what we like. It's even worse now. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> um, so if, where it says our business, uh, that probably now means Google's business, yeah. Um, and and Fitbit may, yeah, and it's sold a switch. Alter, that's quite interesting. Um, alter, alter where you've been and alter what the record actually says. Well, that's a bit weird. And can you actually download and install software updates for you? <laughs> interesting. We'll come back to that. Notify, ch notify changes, but uses acceptance. In other words, you might get told that there's a, that, that you might get told. You might get told. How will you get told for, by Fitbit that your that your terms and conditions have been changed? What happens if you don't, if you just wear the Fitbit because you want to look good and it looks cool to have a Fitbit on and you don't connect it to your mobile phone. So you never know when the, when the terms and conditions have been updated. The whole thing is not thought through, but we'll come back to that um, in a minute. Um, Sangsun's S, S Health, which is another, another such device, which mon again monitors health and fitness 
um, Samsung can use the data to pursue their legitimate interests. What are that? <laughs> well, Samsung's legitimate interests, I have no idea. But it doesn't really matter because even if, even if you don't like what they do to legitimate interest, it says they can change it at will anyway. <laughs> <laughs> What's the position in law? It assumed that people have given permission for their data to be accessed and is it, is it assumed? I, I, I'm not sure what the answer to that is. I don't know if I if I knew if I knew that's a very open ended question. You know, what's the position of law? Um, but um, as one judge once put it, um, we're all a nation of liars. You know, because you know you read these terms and conditions when you when when you get a Fitbit and you say, have you read these? In the case of Apple, thirty five thousand words to buy an Apple. Um, have you read these thirty five thousand words to buy an Apple and agree to it? Yes. You know, so. Yes. As you say, as one judge says, we're all a nation of liars. Sorry, Stephen. Uh, on the question of what does it say in law. It depends on whose law it is. A lot of this stuff is written under the law of Delaware or Wisconsin. Um, you, you, you're, you're right in a way, Stephen, that, uh, that a lot of this law is probably written by Americans for American, for Americans. Delaware outside, and Wisconsin. But no, but no, that's not, that's not entirely the case. Ohio. Um, and I'd say in the case of Apple, for example, those 35,000 words are English specific words um, rather than Delaware words. But I do take your point that a lot of this, a lot, a lot, of, a lot of the law, a lot of these terms and conditions will say. The reason is that corporate law is, corporate law in those states is very weak. So, um, Strava, which was interesting because it was in the news, yes, it was in the Times yesterday. Uh, so, Strava is another uh, fitness app. Now, Strava is quite interesting because um, it allows you to, or it allows any user to create what's called a segment. So, for example, you, if you were a Strava user, you could run back to Moorgate or cycle back to Moorgate, it's not very really far from here, or walk back to Moorgate, and then it will record that route. And anybody running on that route, if they're a Strava user, um, can then essentially, if they've got it on automatic, would automatically time them on that route. And uh, then you could see how we do against other Strava users. The trouble or the issue about Strava was that um, lots of people, it can be used in very nefarious ways. So um, the Israeli military found out that, the, that um, there were some people who were, who were walking around military bases, um, leaving Strava routes around, so that when soldiers were around, they, they could see them running and how long it took them to run from A to B. Um, and there was, a, there was there, one of the issues about Strava was that they discovered there was a standard Royal, Royal Navy run in F and Faz Lane that people were doing the standard, the standard Royal Navy fitness routine, which was on a certain distance. And um, basically, you could see all the soldiers running up and down. Um, and also, because, because most of this information is addressable to a single user, it's not difficult sometimes to work out who the actual user was. So, for example, if that Strava user then went to a particular place, which was a submarine, you could work out which submarine they were based on, etc. Um, even more interesting, the government's, uh, or they, they quoted the, the government's instructions to uh, soldiers, which was basically something very bland, like, be aware of your social media use. I'm not even sure the average social, soldier would understand this as social media, let alone uh, associate so internet things with what, it, what, with what it is, which is essentially uh, a means of tracking people. Um, and I didn't, uh, I didn't actually come up with this name, but it's uh, it, it, the, the process of data being leaked through these fitness routines, which are ultimately available to other people, or fit leaking. That was by an American professor. Uh, I don't know if he was in Delaware or not. But... <laughs> so if you are using this exercise use every day, somebody or when you left your home and then they burgled your home, did you sue Strava? Well, that's a fascinating question. But you don't have to. You don't even have to think about think about that. Okay, this is okay. It's, let, let's we're getting we're getting to the Internet of Things security. I'm going to come back to that question, Mike, in about five minutes, because um, it, it kind of opens up a more a, a more obvious means of thought, which is. 
if I want to get information about you, um, do I go through, and, and let's say you work for XYZ Bank, okay? Um, and XYZ Bank has very good security. Why would I want to attack XYZ Bank? Surely it's a lot more, it's a lot more better, easy for, easier for me to attack in the case of a convoy, the lowest, the slowest ship, in the case of internet of connected things device, the lowest, most insecure device. So in other words, if I want to get information about, about you, why, why, do I, why, do I get, why do I hack into the bank? I'm gonna hack into your Samsung fridge because your Samsung fridge is probably a lot, a lot easier to hack into than the bank. So the same thing with Strava, in other words, to the, to the extent that I can get information about you or possibly hack into your own your system because I don't know how what's, what information Strava um, keeps, but to the extent that Strava has, or the Strava device, or if you want to think about Strava device, but you know, think about a physical device, has your passwords in it, or has a password to connect to your Wi-Fi, well, if I can hack into the Strava device, get the, get the password for the Wi-Fi, that's a lot easier, and then by then, get into, get into your home system, and by then, monitor your home system, find out where your password is, get into at your to your employee account in the bank, that's a lot easier than trying to hack into the bank. That's that's the point, that's, that's the general point. Which kind of gets, gets me to the, the nub of this talk, which is what's wrong with the security conceptually about the Internet of Things? Well, think about a device, okay? Now, in the case of these things, the bigger the device, the easier it is to make secure. Now we've had these micro, mi Microsoft uh, Windows devices for donkeys. And uh, you know, every, every Thursday or every, every other Thursday, Microsoft comes up with a whole load of back doors in it, which it's closed and tells us to uh, update the update Microsoft. And in fact, it will usually do, depending upon your settings, it'll essentially do it for you. Um, eventually, um, your Microsoft will go very slow, and uh, things will happen to it if you don't up, if you don't update it. Um, so you'll know you'll know you have to update it if you try and avoid updating it. Um, but you, you're kind of told that you that you need to update it because, of course, you're using the mobile phone, you're using the device all the time. Um, doesn't happen with mobile phones. What's the, how many people have? How many people generally? have an, the up, most up-to-date security version of the mobile phone software on their mobile phone. Anybody know the answer to that? Oh, gosh, a lot of people. iOS 15.6.1. 15.6.1. 15, 15, version 15.6.1. No, 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 no. What, weeks how many, what percentage of people oh. have it updated, have, have, have the most updated version? Anybody know? Sorry? Them? One. So it's about about seven or eight percent of people have the most have, have actually bothered to update their mobile phone. Uh, with, the, with the most with the most up to date available all the time. The reality is that the smaller the device, the less people the less people update it. So if you think about it, if you think about it, it's automatic though. It just happens overnight. Yeah, only if you depends on how you set it, Dave. Depends on mobile phone you've got. It is a lot more complicated than that. You can set it, you can set it automatically, but even then, even then, it won't it won't do it if you haven't left it into charge. There's lots of other things that have to happen. It depends on what mobile phone you've got. And of course, also, um, if you think about uh, mobile phone operating systems, the operating systems are not necessarily the same as a manufacturer. I appreciate they are with Apple, but that's that's an exception, not a rule. I mean, Android is a, is a generic, is, uh, has been described as the least open source, open source software <laughs> project in the world. Um, it, it, come back to Android. I could talk about Android just for now, but I'm not going to. Generic rule, well, the smaller the device, the less, it, the harder it is to make sure it's up to date. So, what can you do with a mobile? With, conceptually, what can you do with an Internet of Things device? You can do one of two things. You can either do essentially what I've just implied, which is that you have a backdoor in the device in order to update the security. 
Because what we know about security is you can have the world's best security, but the world's the best security in the world it has a habit in five or 10 years of not being up to date. Dropbox, in their most famous insecurity issue, lots of insecurity issues, but the most famous Dropbox insecurity issue was quite simple. You know, they had built very good security. Five years later, they hadn't updated it. Oh, somebody found a way in. And that was simply because it was five-year-old security. There wasn't anything wrong with it other than the fact that it hadn't been updated properly. You know, what's, what's, what was easy, hard to get into five years ago wasn't then. Conceptually, you can do that with, a, with an Internet of Things device. Or you can put the world's best security in and then leave it and say, I'm not going to, no backdoors in it. Or you have a backdoor in it, which allows you to update the security in the device. A bit like, a bit like Apple. I like you to update security in the device. Um, trouble with it, okay, Apple is a very complicated um, operating system. Yes, it has been hacked into by the Israelis, but with great difficulty. Um, and, and conceptually, again, uh, I, know how, I, know, I know conceptually how that was done. Um, it, one of the ways it was done was, um, was, was uh, they had some clever software which allowed people who were um, visually impaired to use it, um, which, uh, which was one of the backdoors, one of the ways they found backdoor into Apple at one point in time to be closed now. But the point I'm making is that even Apple has, has difficulties come back to your question in two seconds. Um, even Apple has difficulty, but this, if you think about something which is like a Philips light bulb, which is uh, easy to secure in 2006, 16, also funny enough by some Israelis, um, the, what, why should it be secure? And of course, if you, if, you got a, if you want to hack into that mobile phone, you've got to have access to it. Uh, or, or you want to hack into um, my um, computer, that's not my computer, you've got to have access to it. Well, if you've got, if you've got an Internet of Things device, like a Philips light bulb, you can examine the light bulb for, and find out what the back door is. It's very easy because nobody's going to interfere with that. Uh, with that. You've got your light bulb, you can do what you want with it. Not even necessarily illegal to find out what the back door really is. So if you have a if you have a way of updating the security, then you need some you need some methodology to do that, and it's not difficult conceptually for somebody else to find out what that methodology is, or you don't do that and you have no means of updating it. Uh, in which case, five years later, what was secure five years ago is no longer secure. That to me is the ultimate flaw. Of the internet of, of the internet of things of the internet of things. And certainly conceptually, what most people do most of the time is they put a backdoor in, enabling the device to be updated at some point in time in the future with different with different features, including different security features. So you either have can I just ask the question? Yes. I strongly disagree with putting in an update mechanism, which the user is aware of as a backdoor. A backdoor is something which the user is not aware of. Okay, but think about it conceptually. How does the, the, the this is a dumb device. The dumb device has no, has no idea whether the, whether the update is a bona fide update by the manufacturer or is, a back, is, is, an, is an update by somebody who simply found the means of of updating the device because they understand because they've been able to find what the security feature is in the device which allows it to be updated. So the use of uh, keys and signing of updates, you don't believe that is a way to deliver secure any any means if 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 I am the manufacturer of a device and I allow that device somehow to be updated, in other words, the operating system to be updated and the security features in it to be updated, then by definition, somebody else can find that. And the point I'm making is that the more simpler the device, the less code is in the first place, the easier it is to find it. And, and I have as much time as I want to do it. 
as I say, it's, as I say, it's not it. The, one of the interesting things about most concepts, most security concepts, and one of the reasons that most, that very few people talk about security is because there's no money in it. What do I mean by that? It's not in anybody's interest to take a Phillips light bulb and find out, oh yes, this is highly insecure. So, you know, it's done by university, uh, Tel Aviv University. Universities do occasionally tend to look at stuff and find out why it's insecure. And they're about the only people to do it. Because what's, you know, what's in it for most people? There's no, no point in it. Unless you're a nefarious criminal, you want, it, you want to do it yourself, that's slightly different. But then you're not gonna publicize it anyway. So one of the interesting things about security generally, is that most people don't realize how insecure things are simply because nobody research, does the research in the first place. How many people know how many people know that Angry Birds, when you have Angry Birds on your on your telephone, it sends a list of your contacts to a dodgy Chinese internet site. Did we know that? Found out by the by the Sunday Times and published about 10 years ago. And then David Cameron wondered a few years later why um, his, uh, his con private contact of the, uh, of the MI5 chief, or what it was, or head of C GCHQ, uh, head of GCHQ was, was published, was found out. So it wasn't, it, 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 Angry Birds was his favorite, um, his favorite uh, game. Dave Stewart, I'll, I'll come back. You've already had your question, I'll come back to you. Mm -hmm. So my, my, my fundamental issue about security, net security is you either have embedded security, in which case it's static, you can't update it, or you have some means of updating it, in which case other people can, by definition, update it, and you can, do, you can analyze the device as long as you want to essentially find out what the, where, the, where, the back door, where the back door is. And as I said, the smaller the device, essentially the less secure it is, the less code it's got on it, conceptually, it's got more cost. You're not going to put. You're not going to put lengthy code in it. You don't necessarily need it. Even your your even your concept of security is slightly different. You know, if you're if you if you if you are manufacturing light bulbs, are you really worried about how secure they are? Well, maybe you are. Maybe you aren't. Um, as I say, um, when, when uh, Philips uh, light bulbs were found, uh, you could switch them on and off uh, at your heart's content when they found the the back door to it. As I say, very, not that much, by definition, research goes in to Internet of Things security. Uh, the FBI uh, said that the Mirai bot successfully infected hundreds of thousands of Internet of Things devices. And, and a Hewlett Packard survey, and I don't know how, many, how good the Hewlett Packard survey was, didn't actually say how many devices they'd actually studied. Um, but it said that they found an average of 25 vulnerabilities per IoT device that they studied. Um, the reality is that most of these devices are, in fact, as a matter of fact, uh, not insecure. How many people, I mean, I accept that there are people in this room who are into Internet of Things security and want to make Internet of Things devices secure, secure. but how many people actually buy even a mobile phone thinking about security. I used to, in the days when mobile telephones were bought using brochures, and that wasn't that long ago, um, about four or five years ago, when I started talking about mobile phone security, I used to bring the brochures, you know, the Vodafone brochure and the Three brochure, and the Orange brochure. I used to get them from the shop, I used to bring them to a lecture like this. And Vodafone had about a quarter of a page on security. And that was it. None of the other brochures had anything at all about security. How many people go, how many people go to the, how many people go to the, and I, I know this, I know we four person because I had a conversation with them before, but how many people actually go to the manufacturer and say, a, a, a Bosch and say, how secure is your dishwasher then? <laughs> let, alone, let alone see, see how it's advertised. The, the reality is that people don't even think about those aspects. So, um, you know, when Philips go on to, and say they're going to they're do heart monitoring, and they are doing heart monitoring, 
um, by uh, monitoring your heart and uh, you wear a device, it, you, you wear a device and then it connects to your telephone and then your telephone connect, uh, communicates to the hospital. So the hospital know 24 seven, whether you're well or not, that worries me. And if you think it worries me, who's, the, who's this guy? Dick Cheney. Thank you, who said that? Well done, Dick Cheney. And who was Dick Cheney? XVP. Security. Ex Vice President of the United States. 19, sorry, 2001, he became Vice President of the US. Now, who here has wears a heart monitor? No, you don't have to put your hand up. I know, I know, I know Dunham had your hands up before. You don't have to put your hand up for this. Um, so um, if you have a heart, if you if you have a dodgy heart, then you get a heart pacemaker fitting. Now, heart operations are not good, by which I mean it's not a good idea to have a heart operation if you can possibly avoid it. So back in the 90s, somebody had a great idea saying, let's put heart monitors in that are internet addressable so that we can essentially, if you have to tweak the heart from 60 beats to 62 beats a minute or whatever it may be, um, we don't have to operate on you again. We can just uh, lie down, twist, you know, and essentially address the Internet of Things device because that's what it is. Uh, and then we'll, we'll change the heart, we'll change the number of beats per minute. That's what Dick Cheney had when he became vice president. Um, and the Secret Service went bananas and said, you can't have an internet addressable heart mate, because that means that some dodgy Arab could come along and switch it on to I don't know, 75 beats a minute and kill you. <laughs> so Dick Cheney, when he was made uh, vice president uh, and the Secret Service found out about this, went, had to have another dangerous heart, heart operation to, put him, to give him a manually uh, adjustable uh, heart monitor. Um, so you know, I don't know if you went back afterwards, but you know, you know, to have another dodgy operation to have a heart. So even if you think it's, even if you think I don't think that, that uh, what I'm thinking is true, um, the reality is uh, it is true, and it was true as long as goes 2001 uh, that uh, internet addressable things can be dodgy. And I'm not going to talk about all sorts of interesting things like spoofing drones. Of course, you've seen this in, in, in recently. And spoofing of yachts uh, to show to, to try and get somebody to, you know try to get yachts to go onto rocks and things like that by spoofing GPS signals and stuff like that. But you think about the, the actual connectivity of these devices, and this is kind of the answer to Mike's question. You know, why why would I want to if I if I was in if I wanted to break into somebody's house or I wanted to find out if they weren't in? Why would I? You know, there's lots of easy ways to do that, and surely the easier way to do that is to break into their Internet of Things fridge than it is it, it, is, it, is to any any anything else. So what is the le what is the least connected device um, that I can that I can break into? That's 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 the way that you would do it. Um, and who's the guy on the bottom right underneath Dick Cheney? Um, anybody know who that is? The chap whose daughter was killed recently. The chap whose daughter was killed recently. That chap whose daughter was killed. No, I don't think so. As far as I know, um, this is a guy called um, Chris Roberts. And he was famous. In fact, in fact, he got arrested for doing this. And then after, be, after he was arrested, the FBI said, can he come and work for us instead? Um, because what he actually did was he flew from um, West Coast to East Coast of, of um, US. And it, so it wasn't that far. It was three or four hours in the air. And uh, what he essentially showed was that you could get into the aircraft control systems via the entertainment. So he was just sitting there with a laptop connected to the entertainment system and essentially managed to show that you could get into the aircraft control system and crash the plane. Um, so again, it just goes to show that, you know, what you're going to do is you're going to get in through the least connected device. You don't actually need high tech to 
get an automated car, an AI car, so-called intelligent <coughs> crash, you don't need, you don't need to have, yes, you can have a, a spoof, all sorts of interesting spoofing devices, um, and you can you can hack into hack into the, the software if you want to in a, in, a, in a car, but it's much easier. You just need some sticky tape, and if you stick the tape the right way, it's been shown. You stick the tape the right way over a, a stop sign. It looks like a sixty mile an hour foot speed sign, and the car will just go zooming on. It hasn't been practiced. It was just done theoretically. So I, didn't exactly, oh, I didn't, yeah. didn't actually know. Didn't actually know that it was a stop sign. I thought it was a sixty mile an hour sign. So you, you can just do it with sticky tape, but you can use more high tech solutions if you want to. So I'm going to talk a little bit about book before I officially finish at half past. Take some questions, more questions. I hope. Uh, talk a little bit more about some different uh, different law. And um, what I, th there's no specific, there's very little specific law about the Internet of Things. Um, but so uh, look at some old law, which is product liability, which is essentially the highest obligation that anyone within Europe has to make a product in inverted commas safe. I'm not going to talk about what I mean by safe there, but there is a concept of safety under product liability. And um, yeah, so something like a toaster, for example, um, the basic obligation, if you put product onto the market, it has to be safe for 10 years. That's uh, 10 years from essentially from the date that it's first sold. So if you find that there is an insecurity in your code, is there an obligation to release it? Is there an obligation to ensure that it goes to every future owner of your toaster? Or does your obligation finish at the point in time when you originally sold it? Well, the short answer to that is that if you sell a toaster with, which, is, which, is, which is connected, and then you decide that it's, in, that it's not safe, then you do have an obligation essentially to uh, either withdraw the post, either try and, get, try and uh, have a product recall on it, uh, or update it. How on earth are you going to update it? You know, I deal with product recalls for traditional products. How on earth are you going to, you're going to manage to do it for a product where you need to update the software? I have no idea. Uh, I mean, man car manufacturers have the greatest difficulty because not everybody in the car manufacturers don't necessarily know when you sold your car. Um, it's exactly the same with a toaster or anything else. How do you future-proof the, the safe? The security and safety are by definition interchangeable. You cannot have something which, you, which is inverted commas secure without it being safe. You cannot have something which is inverted commas safe without it also being secure. The two, you have to have one with the other. Uh, to that extent, they are, they're, they're a subset of each other. So how do you actually allow for those, for those products to be updated? Well, Philips light bulbs, it, it, even more so. How do I make sure, how can I ever uh, update the, the software in the Philips light bulb? Well, how do I actually do it in the toaster? Well, if the toaster is connected, then there, there's, a, there, there, there's a possibility that you can do it. If the, if the Philips light bulb is connected, there's a possibility you do it. But how do you configure it? Um, is there an obligation after 10 years? Well, I'd say probably uh, there isn't, but if you don't, if you decide that you're not gonna update it, you almost certainly have an obligation to essentially have a product recall. And then you have issues of privacy. As I say, I could talk about GDPR and privacy uh, for two hours, but what's the point? There is no point. You can't have GD, you can't, you can't have data protection and Internet of Things, the two things are completely and utterly incompatible. If I have a, if I have lots of it, lots of issues, these car manufacturers that I put up there, the MW Jaguar, Lundy, of Mercedes, Nissan, all had all shown uh, to have dodgy, dodgy cars by the side, by the, in the sense that the second owner of the car knew how, knew, and you could find out driving history and driving details of the first owner. Um, there we go. Um, not. Um, pri not private from that specific, from that example by that definition. Um, uh, what else does the software actually do? As I say, you know, you think the software might do some things, but what, what, other, what other aspects um, does it does it do? Uh, do you have any control as to what the uh, what the software updates actually do? Um, different example 
um, more recent example, which is a UK example, is about motor car charging points. Now, these are very quite interesting because, um, at least I'm interested in motor car charging points, because conceptually, this is all about the government um, waking up to the fact that getting everybody for having electric cars is not as easy as it sounds. It might sound easy, but it isn't. Um, and the government has been told left for donkey's years that it wasn't easy. And they said, oh, no, we're going to get everybody in electric cars by 2030. Of course, we're now an issue because, as I understand it, um, electric cars are now more expensive to run than these are all petrol cars now. Leave that aside. So um, the problem with electric cars is that if everybody, if you have an electric car, when are you going to charge it? Well, most people will charge their car when they get home at night after they work at 5 30, 6 o'clock, whenever it is they get home from work, they'll plug their car in. What's the problem with that? Well, first of all, it's cheap time. And secondly, if more than about 15% of the people who have cars do that, their grid falls over. Um, and that's been known for donkey's years. So you can't have mobile car, you can't have people driving mobile cars and then going home and charging them. It might sound obvious, but you can't do that because you haven't got enough electricity to do that. Um, there are lots of uh, clever, clever things that people have decided to do instead, um, but they don't really help you, like having cars themselves um, store the charge for the grid and fill, give the grid back charge. But that's in the middle of the night, not in the, not in the daytime. So, um, Government wants to have everybody having, having mobile cars. So first of all, we need lots of mobile um, car charging points. So at the moment, um, if you've got a mobile car charging point, it has to be essentially a smart smart um, meter. It's essentially you're mandated now since June this year that if you sell or install a mobile car charging unit, it's got to be a smart meter. Uh, what I mean by smart or some of the features of what I mean by smart in a minute. It's got to be a smart one. And the, the government's intention is also, is they, they announced at some point in time this year, they haven't done it yet, I don't think, um, they are going to introduce legislation. So if you build a new house, that you have to build a charging point to that house. So that's every new house will be an extra, an extra thousand pounds conceptually, because every new house will have to have uh, it, which was built in the future, we'll have to have a charging point. But again, if you think about it and you want people to drive mobile car, car, electric cars, you've got to do that. Can't mandate everybody who's got a house already to have a mobile car charging point, but you can mandate all the people who build new houses that they've also got to have a mobile car charging point, which will be a smart charging point. The, the legislation um, says that it's got to, got to be, or the, the charging point has to be designed to minimize operation by the owner. So the owner should have as little interaction with the charging, with the charging point as possible. But of course, again, um, they know that they're going to have to change the software <coughs> devices um, because the, 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 at the moment the legislation says that if you plug your, char your car in, it's not necessarily going to get charged then. Say if everybody charges when they want to charge, then there's not enough electricity to get around. So the there's an you plug your car in, there's an automatic delay determined by the essentially electricity companies uh, as to when the charge will appear. And at the moment it's up to 30 minutes. So and there are various there are various means at the moment to override it. And that's all in the legislation. But the legislation allows essentially or mandates that the manufacturer of the, of the mobile car charging point has to be able to update that in the future because the legislation might change because there won't be enough electricity to get around. So they may have to, as, mo, as, as, mo, as electric cars become more popular, the government has to have a means to essentially overrule the way in which charging points work because otherwise there isn't enough electricity at peak time. So the first rule is that the design has to be has to minimize the intervention by the owner, which is quite sensible because if I buy if you buy a new house with a with a mobile car charging point in and you sell it two years later, well, you know, what does the owner, what does the new owner know about the mobile car charging point? Maybe an electric car. So 
Um, there has to be the minimal amount of use by the, by the owner. You have to provide guidance on how to establish adequate security. How on earth are you going to teach an, a, a user of a mobile car charging point adequate security? I have no idea. I'm just telling you what the legislation is. Adequate cryptographic techniques against um, cyber attack. Well, again, um, at the, is that at the point of time or is that all the time? Is this static security that it's great today, but it's not great in five years time? Or is this that uh, you've got to be able to update it all the time? Not, not clear in the legislation. But it does say, what it does say is it implies that, it, that there's some back door in the system because it implies that it has to, you have to automatically, instead of talking about automatic updates of, uh, of Apple, it has to automatically update periodically. In other words, the, uh, the owner shouldn't have to actually control when the software of the device updates. Uh, uh, diary, quick question. The regulation about charge points and this potential delay, is that just for domestic installations or for any charge point? Uh, good question. Um, from memory, we're just talking about domestic. Right, okay. Uh, there, are, there is a different rule for local authority right. ones. Um, well, this is, this well, is domestic about, home ones. Yeah, yeah, yeah right. I think about it because of the refuel situation. You're literally pulling up, to, you plug it in. <laughs> but if you think about it, you know, conceptually, they haven't got much of a choice. Mm. But it does, it does kind of um, interesting. Uh, you were told, Mike was giving, you, you gave me the example about, you know, what happens if somebody uses my strata to, in, 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 to, to, to know when I'm not in the house. Okay, let me give you a mobile, mobile charging point example, okay? Um, let's say that your child is not well. Okay. So, you know, you might have to take your child to hospital at any time. Yeah. And you go home and you plug your car in mm -hmm. and 20 minutes later, you've got to take your child to the hospital and you can't because there's no charge there. And you didn't know that. Who's responsible? Um, charge the government the Uber bill. <laughs> 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 These things aren't advertised. Um, yeah, and there have been attempts to uh, to, to have more... Have, have some other legislation about the Internet of Things. Uh, there's there's uh, these four US states, amongst others. Uh, they don't say very much apart from things like having reasonable security, whatever that means. Uh, as, as I say, it's a legal really, term. Do, sorry? It's a legal term. Legal. <laughs> Reasonableness is legal. Yeah, but it doesn't. It doesn't mean, what, what's reasonable? <laughs> you have you have I have no idea. What, you have to pay a lawyer to, you have to pay a lawyer to tell you what's reasonable. <laughs> yeah, uh, and then, and uh, as I already said, you know, you've got and also has a, has a has a federal act as well, which is that things survive security improvement act. But again, that just talks about re reasonable security. It's not really it doesn't really take things very much further. Yeah, at all. And uh, this jurisdiction is it applied in the world or it just in America? Just in America. And in fact, if you look at the California legislation, only in California, Nevada, only in Nevada, etc. Okay, so it doesn't apply in EU or. No, there's no EU, there's no there's no there's no EU proposal of any concept context in this. Um, just my final point before I shut up and and, uh, and answer a question is why have I not actually talked about the EPR? You know, I, you know, I blithely said it's completely irrelevant. But why is it irrelevant? If you think about it. The GDPR was 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 promulgated. Uh, late because they, it was originally uh, it was a, it was leaked in 2015 and uh, sorry it was leaked in 2014 um, and then eventually eventually published uh, in 2016 and, and became law in 2016 um, and came into effect in 2018. When was it originally? Think about. Now this this is a this is an enormous piece of legislation that went through the European system. Can we call it that? How, how long did it take to actually from somebody having an idea or let's have, let's improve data protection to actually writing? Well, the answer is probably best part of eight or nine years. Mm. So this was originally written, essentially mid 2000s, 2005, 2006, about ten years earlier, give or take. And those days, well, as I said, um, it, Internet of Things was known about. Dick Cheney example was 2001, but not many people knew about them and not many people cared about them. 
even today, not many people care about them, how many people actually say buy an Internet of Things device because it's inverted commas secure or have, have a quite famous concept, it might be insecure or even understand what we're talking about today. The, the reality is that GDPR was out of date before, well before it was ever public, which is why it's completely relevant in this, in this context. It was not written for things like uh, mobile telephones, really, let alone, let alone uh, Internet of Things device, which is why it's, uh, as I say, complete anathema and completely futile for us all about what happened. Thank you very much indeed. Um, I don't know how many people have, have answered questions electronic, have asked questions electronically, David, uh, but you'll now doubt tell us. But I'm um, happy to take questions. In the next, in the next, so. Okay, I'll go first. Um, we've got a question from Therese. How do you safely scale devices to thousands or millions, e.g. smart meters? How do I safely scale devices? How do I safely scale devices? Well, I think the answer is um, one of the ways to do it is not like Philips did. So <laughs> the way Philips did is that, was that each light bulb, so to promulgate updates, Philips had designed the system so that if you had uh, a building with a thousand light bulbs in, you, can't, you updated one light bulb with the updated software, and then it kind of flipped to the next light bulb, and then flipped to the next light bulb, and flipped to the next light bulb. It was designed to do that. So maybe that wasn't such a good idea, because once you essentially, once you managed to corrupt, which is what they did as an experiment, one light bulb, all the light bulbs essentially corrupted themselves. And one of the ways to do it is not to do it that way. But there again, well, how else could you do it if you think about light bulbs? And, and uh, you know, there are a lot of money, a lot of money in smart buildings where you can automatically switch light bulbs and everything else electronically in the building to try and save, save money. But I don't know what the, the right answer to that question is. There was an interesting case in the US recently. It's happened eight times with the, the ring doorbells, which, uh, to digress, Ken Monroe, I saw Ken Monroe, the, the ethical hacker, put a map of them all up in the US and asked us, do, do you want to open the doors? Um, but uh, of, of them providing information, video information of burglaries, um, because the, the burglar had approached the door and was forcing the door to get in. Uh, but if you're a thousand miles away, it's not much you can actually do about it, but it made the burglar identifiable. Um, but that begs the question that they actually had the information to give to the uh, law enforcement people, which they say, well, we only give it in, in exceptional circumstances, but they did have it to give. So in, in, in other words, in that particular example, Ring headquarters had essentially themselves kept a copy of whatever it was that they were. You know, it's like Alexa, uh, having a stranger sitting in the corner of your room. <laughs> yeah, and that, to be fair, I mean, there've been a lot of a lot of examples. I mean, I could have I could have talked for twenty minutes on different examples of, of internet of internet device insecurity, and quite often these devices come with. Um, a, a connected password, if you like, a sort of stand, a, a sort of default password. Um, so there was a there was a, uh, an example given of a kid's baby monitor, which came with a, um, a connected password, a, a, yeah, default password. And the idea was you put the monitor in the kid's bedroom, and you could be downstairs in the in the living room, and you could see the kid uh, being safely safely asleep in their cot or whatever it was. And then how many people actually had updated the, the, this default password? The answer is virtually nobody. And then somebody discovered the way in. Um, so 90% of all the baby, baby monitors in the world were visible to feed files. So, you know, that, that's, that's, that's the issue. And this was, just, this was just changing the default password when he got the device in the first place. That's easy to fix. That's an easy problem to fix. In theory, it is, but you've got no, to it's not in theory. It's an, it's an easy problem to fix. You just make the device only work for three days, 
and force you to change the password. Well, that That's easy. That would be interesting. <laughs> how, many people, how many people would then, but it, this cost, how many people would then after three days phone up the man, let alone the, the manufacturer, the retailer, and say, they I don't work that you sold me. I mean, yes, you, you, well, you have to theory. say you need to, you need to, you need to uh, change the password or, or it won't continue to work. Get used to it. Actually, similar to that, your comment earlier about smaller, cheaper devices being less secure. Mm. One way is have a best before. And they they will stop working after a fixed period. It forces you to actually replace it. That would be uh, interesting. Uh, Built in obsolescence. <laughs> <laughs> like uh, Blade Runner. So, yeah. I'll stick on the lens. Do you think the government's uh, secure by design policy guidance is going to have a positive impact, or do you think it's going to be ignored? So GDPR, so GDPR, you you said government, I think. Well, so it's the government. as well. It's, it's privacy by design is a is a uh, how shall I say an underlying theme within GDPR, uh, which it is. Um, yeah, no, there's no impetus at all to make who. Stephen's, Stephen's idea is not as mad as it sounds, having a, having a baby monitor that defaults after three days and doesn't work properly if you don't pass, change a password. Um, it's not that daft an idea. Uh, and yes, it would be a way of having a security design. Um, but it's not going to happen because there's no, there's no impetus for it to happen. The ECMS has published guidance on both requirements, which is NCSC, is looking to drive. Do you think that they will push that to become legislation? Do you think it will drive? Um, I, I, I don't think, as I say, I come back to the question as is what I said. How many people here have ever bought a telephone by security? You know, if we were buying telephones by security, we'd all still use Nokias <laughs> because they were the most secure, no question about it. The only people who eventually used Nokias was the police and they eventually gave them up. Um, the reality is people don't buy devices because they are secure. David, you've got another question. Yeah, I think it's related from Jamie. What are your thoughts about the new UK product security bill and will it make a difference? The new, the new UK product security bill? I don't think I don't think legislation at this stage is going to make the slightest bit of difference because it's not it's not the legislation itself it's consumers you know how many consumers are not interested in security on their mobile phones let alone Internet of Things devices. Uh, so you know, if you can't even get people in, in, interested in, in internet in security on on mobile phones, how how much less so uh, you have to inspect the uh, inspect the internet of things device? You know, people are looking either at the functionality. Yes, I'll have that functionality. It's, it'd be useful for me to switch my light bulbs off on and off when, I, when I'm not at home, or rather, um, switch my heating on and off uh, when I'm at home, which is probably a more uh, a more Realistic example, um, but reality. And again, um, the uh, the British Gas. Um, I can't remember what the British Gas uh, product name was. Hive. Sorry, Hive. But yeah, again, that was that, that was that that at one point in time was uh, was supposed to have a, a generic default password uh, until it was until you changed it. Hi. No, does the, does the inter, does the doesn't the IOC have the power to intervene if it could be bothered? The IOC. Sorry, the IC. The, the, the ICO, the Information Commissioner's Office. Uh, uh, yes, yes, is the short answer. Yes, I mean in theory, bothered. GDPR applies in theory. As I say, it's just a complete nonsense to try and apply it. But yes, in theory, the ICO has lots of powers uh, in this regard. But I mean. Even trying to get why on earth with the if you were the ICO, why on earth would you be interested in the Internet of Things? You know, when you get four thousand numerically four and a half thousand GDPR complaints a year, sorry, GDPR notifications a year, which are probably something like at least at minimum twenty five percent, more likely five percent of the actual number of breaches. So you're getting a, a four and a half thousand massively multiplied number of breaches a year, and you note you you end up finding about half a dozen. You know how much you haven't got the resource to start worrying about things like ICA things, yeah. um, and you would have you would take the same decision if you were the ICA. Oh, when we have a laptop or mobile phone, at least we have a user interface to update software because we can see it. But a lot of IoT, there there are no standard user interface like. 
a coffee maker or a vacuum cleaner. So it's actually for us user, it's very difficult for us to know when I need to update my software. Or exactly, yeah, precisely, I agree. Um, could it be done in theory? Yes, it could be done. In theory, you could, you could imagine you could imagine going back to, to, to a system where you buy the vacuum cleaner and you can't, you can't actually use the vacuum cleaner until you properly log it on uh, and register it on your computer. And then uh, if you don't update your computer, um, then it recognizes that fact and stops using and it says little flashing uh, sign on the vacuum cleaner that says I'm not connected to your computer, so you can't use me or whatever it is. Uh, you could theoretically do it, but nobody's going to buy it then. Nobody, nobody wants it then. Um, you know, there are still very, very few products which come with dongles. Anybody know what a dongle is? Yeah, yeah. <laughs> there, are, there, are, there are some very few products, consumer products, that come with dongles. Most, most known example I know of is expensive sewing machines that come with a dongle. And if you don't use the dongle, then you can't use the software in it. That sewing machine, trust me, is all about, is all about thousands of pounds worth of software in it. You have to have a dongle to use it. So you could, you could con conceivably have the same system with, your, in your example, a, a vacuum cleaner, but vacuum cleaners are so low price, nobody would buy the vacuum cleaner then. Isn't that rather like the, the system you see in tools, in, especially in bars, where the bar, the bar staff have a, a card which they have to touch on the till to be able to use it it's not conceivably different is it no i mean yeah it's, it, 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 but that's done for different reasons for security security <laughs> yeah but, but that's, that's for real yeah that's for real reasons and also because the pub owner wants to know which which bartender has done that particular transaction for a variety of reasons i mean there's a, there's an impetus to do it which there isn't with a domestic vacuum cleaner Sure. I was thinking, why why wouldn't it, you know, just like I sort of, I sort of associate with climate change and, and ESG, that, that's what brands our brands will drive that that future. They're, they'll be the ones driving that change and will actually build that into devices and help because customers will choose that. Eventually, those brands that do that stuff, just like the play that Apple have done now, and you said Apple are one of the strongest ones there. Like it will be brands that will drive that, and I, I agree. I don't think governments are the ones that need to do that. It's brands that will drive that change as a result. Of the customers will choose them because of that. Conceptually, that is that is possible. Um, but again, brands will only drive things that they think they are going to attract their consumers. Exactly. So it's that quite, I mean, it's quite interesting to say there was an experiment. There was a there was a trial recently um, about when I was talking about mobile car, uh, mo mobile vehicles, and charging, and saying that actually uh, there is a concept now of. How can we, how can we, um, every country's got this issue that, you know, there is a peak demand and there's low demand and you want to kind of try and get people to put the washing machine on in the middle of the night because that's when there's low demand rather than five o'clock in the afternoon when the peak, when there's peak demand. So there, there was an experiment done by the government about um, using motor cars to essentially deliberately Char charge um, and in other words so you go to work and you're charged you come home you you may be still got a 70 percent charge use that 70 percent charge when you plug in at half past five in the evening to drain it car down to 15 percent and then charge the car up overnight now interestingly the only brand that, that, that was available, that by which I mean the only car manufacturer that had done that to enable the car to be able to use in the trial was... Tesla. Sorry? Tesla. No. <laughs> Kia, Nissan, and Nissan yeah. Kia, uh, which was the cars that were used because they were the only ones capable of, of, of doing that. Um, but I mean, again, it goes back to the, well, what happens if I've got a kid that I need to make me in the hospital at five o'clock, eight o'clock in the evening and I've got no charge of my car? Mm -hmm. Most people have range anxiety in their car. Um, they, you know, they'd be particularly anxious and have range for that sort of issue. Okay. We've got time for one last online question. This is from Derek. Who has ultimate responsibility to protect privacy data? Is it the seller, the buyer, or the manufacturer? Who has the ultimate responsibility to collect privacy data? And that's a fascinating question. First question to answer is, whose data is it anyway? <laughs> it's my data, isn't it? This is, you know, this is at the end of the day, if I've got a Fitbit and I decide to wear it and I decide to connect it to my phone and I, I transmit it to Uncle Tom Cobley and all that I'm wearing it and doing whatever I'm, I'm doing with my Fitbit. Um, whose data is it? Any, whose responsibility is it apart from mine? 
how can I? Yeah, yes, uh, I'm giving my information to Fitbit. And uh, as we saw before, Fitbit can give it to whoever they think um, they're doing a joint venture with or whoever it was. Um, they're free to, they're free to, uh, Fitbit free to use it for me. So yeah, they can, they can use it for the purpose of offering and proving their Fitbit's business. But I mean, Fitbit's business might be subcontractors and all. Uh, I've no idea who Fitbit are going to give that data to. And if it's now Google, then uh, it's probably embedded within the Google policy that they can use it in other parts of their business and all sorts of interesting things. Absolutely. Uh, the reality, I think the, re the answer to that question is the only person who can be responsible for the use of that data is me. It's my data. If I don't want it to be used in that way, then I, I need not be a nation of liars. I have to look at the, 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 the see what it see what the, the device says. Only small print. You agree. Only small print. You agree to release your data to the. Yeah, print. exactly. That's right. Um, I'll, I'll just finish off with some advice to you. Um, but uh, since since David said that was the last uh, the last uh, online question, has anybody else had a question? Well, if anybody else has another question, you can buy me a question. Uh, there's a, there's a, there's an interesting lie about lawyers. And what the interesting lie about lawyers is you can't ask a lawyer a free question. Now I'll let, I'll let you into the secret. You can ask me a question for free whenever you want. The real trick is how you get me to answer it. If you buy me a beer later on, I might do that. So you had a question. Is it your belief that the concept of Internet of Things is basically insecure? Yeah, because you've got this ultimate choice about either internet security, in which case it's great now, but is it going to be great in five years' time, uh, which is static security, or you have this situation where by definition, anybody can come along and uh, the manufacturer can come along and update it. If the manufacturer can come along and update it, then I, if I'm clever enough and have got enough patience or and I've got nefarious enough no reason, can do exactly the same. So that's the ultimate answer to that question as to why. So um, this was a bit of Barclays um, advice, Barclays Bank advice that was given uh, as long ago as um, 2018. It was a sponsored piece in the Times by, um, by Barclays in 2018. So this was actually talking about lots of things, not just, uh, not just internet things. So apply and configure firmware just as you would with a smartphone. <laughs> I haven't tried to do this with my connected vacuum cleaner. So. And then, as I said before, smartphones anyway, how many people have got their smartphones up to date? Well, according to uh, a micro survey, less than six and a half percent of Android users had a late uh, um, security software on their, on their Android. So um, if, you do the sa if you do the same for, the, for, the, for hard Internet of Things device, even worse. Create a separate guest account. Um, I'm not sure whether that will make it more secure or less secure. I think that, uh, again, um, yes, I guess you could um, in, you could conceivably have a different network. That might be better. Um, so you have one network for your Internet of Things devices and another network for your mobile, for your potentially your working from home, your office account, you uh, log in on with your computer to your office account. That might work. If it was a completely segregated network, that would be a good idea. Well, well, I don't think a guest your device was communicating with other devices and the IoT. And the problem is the problem with the Internet of Things is you've got as long as you want to find the back door. Yeah, it's not like it's not like any other anything else where you, know, you want to find you want to break it to my mobile phone. You've only got two seconds to do it. Well, I give it while well, I've got it in your possession. Um, Use strong, use unique pa passwords for each device. How many people have unique passwords at the moment for each login that they have on their internet account, let alone, let alone having a separate strong password unique for every internet security? You have to write it down. Don't use default passwords. I've talked about that before. Disable, disable universal plug and play. On a router, yeah, but that's really how routers are configured. And again, how many people know how to how to reconfigure their router so it's not doesn't have universal. 
And protect your computers and phone with updating antivirus software. That's fine for, you, fine for your computers, although phones, antivirus software on phones is probably in the extreme. Um, maybe try and manage to do that very well at the moment. Uh, have separate antivirus <coughs> on the phone. Separate in the phone, which is not really good very well now. Don't allow anyone access, you don't know, remote access to your computer. Well, well fine. <laughs> <laughs> It's got a default password, that's not going to help you very much. And this is a great one, the final one. Ask sellers what precautions to take. <laughs> Trying out <laughs> Amazon Marketplace. <laughs> when you buy your AliExpress. Um, lots of very interesting things. I could have talked for hours about the law and how it doesn't apply, how, how it doesn't apply to Internet of Things devices. And um, one, of, one of the interesting things to do at the moment is uh, is medical devices. So medical devices, you can't sell medical devices in this country unless uh, unless essentially uh, you go through lots of hoops and you can't just sell vaccines and stuff like that. Unless you go, well, vaccines, bad example, because that's a medicine, but you can't, you know, you can't sell. Um, ligaments for your leg or artificial uh, hip implants or whatever it is unless you can prove they're safe and that they are medically beneficial and yet you have people like samsung say you know buy our samsung bet it'll make you more healthy i think well who was talking before about the internet about the uh, the the um ICO not um, enforcing data protection legislation. I mean, this is criminal legislation to say that this is going to improve your health and then not, not actually uh, be able to prove that it's improving your health. And none of these companies have got medical device uh, approvals for yes, representatives. You think, uh, how are they managing to get away with that then? All different issues relating to Internet of Things, which nobody is addressing because it's all goes into the two difficult box. Mm -hmm. Any other questions I'm happy to answer. We, we, I think we're going to get cut out at nine o'clock. Is that right, uh, darling? No, too no, I've been out of IT for a long more questions. time, but I've been out of IT for a long time, and this might be a daft question. Is there enough distinct addresses for all the people that might want the car or smart charge or fit me connected to the internet? Is there enough? addresses enough servers to, to cope with that? That's a very good question, actually, and I will answer it. So the question was, is there enough addresses on the internet? Yeah, is, yeah. And is the service. short answer. And what I first started talking about yeah. things five, six years ago, and I was talking about my first slide about requirements, what do you need for the internet things to work? One of the things you need, you needed past tense for the internet of things to work was what's called IoT six. Yeah. We had IoT four, which basically just yes. no enough addresses. But IoT six came in about four or five years ago, and with the IoT six, which is basically a different address, a longer telephone number, if you like. Mm -hmm. So it gives, it gives you more unique access codes for Internet of Things. The answer is no. The answer is at the moment no. Um, and uh, so, it, not in the foreseeable future. There's no. There's no. Uh, there's no problem about number of different addressable. Unique addressable addresses. You've got the network bandwidths and all sorts, and whether fiber is used and you yeah. basically What's only it? addressed only address the consumer. Off, yeah. There's a much bigger problem, which is the process market. It is the built environment, which the government is planning to take all the sensors from across the entire built environment across the UK. And, and put it into a national digital twin. That's a much bigger problem. I, I'm, I don't deny it, David. I say there's lots of other things that I could have talked about if I'd had the time. But that will be how the problem is solved, because they'll have to solve that. Well, I think that's a very good end point. It suggests to me that we've got lots more events coming up on things like infrastructure and firmware and so on. But Guy is a technology lawyer, as you probably gathered. But boy, oh boy, hasn't he opened up a whole load of issues, sure, relating to technology, relating to law, but also relating to our society. There are a lot of things that we need to examine, and we can be in instrumental in terms of researching and contributing to the solutions going forward. Firstly, please join me. Thank you.